Lord Jesus, that is our prayer tonight. And just as we jump into your word, I ask, Lord, that you would just give us a greater revelation of yourself this evening. I pray, Jesus, that you would show us your heart. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be able to move through the mess and the chaos at times that is our life. And I pray, Jesus, just for a clear picture of yourself as you make your way towards us. Help us to be open to receiving you. I pray this in your name. Amen. We are now four weeks into our summer series, and it is called What's in a Word? So we've been looking at one word each week, and we are now looking at worship tonight. The first week we had looked at believe, then after that we looked at love, then we looked at forgiveness, and now we're looking at worship. So these, this is a 10-week series we're doing, and it is basically just 10 transformational verbs that we'll find in the New Testament. So tonight is worship, but before we move to the slide and talk about what's ahead, does anyone remember the verse? We also have a verse that we've been learning each week, trying to memorize it. Does anyone have that? I have a $10 gift card. I know, I know that Worship Cafe is going to be upset tomorrow because they're not going to get this, but I have a $10 gift card to Starbucks. If anyone can tell me the verse on forgiveness. Who has it? <laughs> Colossians 3.13, yes, do you know it? He said you could do the last line? All right, give me the last line. Forgive as Christ forgave you. I will take it. (laughs) Sterling will be upset tomorrow. I'm going to get him in a little trouble. That's okay. I just won't be receiving a paycheck. He'll get the last laugh. That's all right. All right, so yes, it was Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So tonight we're moving on to worship. So I began just brainstorming all the ways that I have used the word worship in church. To me, this is similar to the word love. It gets used all the time. Now, especially in church life, we throw out the word worship all the time. So I started thinking back, especially to college, when I used to have conversations with my mom. I'd call home every single week And I'd have to go through every single day of the week and give her all of the details, everything that had taken place. And so then I get to Sunday, and generally a conversation might go something like this. And I get to Sunday, and I say, well, today I attended the worship service at our chapel. I had a lot of homework this afternoon, so I decided I didn't want to drive too far, so I stayed here to worship. And then it may continue, if if worship was good, that week, I may say something like, oh my gosh, mom, worship was incredible today. And you should have seen the worship leader, sandy blonde, curly hair. She's got a beautiful voice, mom. I'll tell you, it's it's different than anything I've heard before. It's so unique. It is so gorgeous. And the love of Jesus just shines through her when she is worshiping. Or maybe I didn't enjoy worship that Sunday, and I would say, I was so disappointed, Mom. I was really looking forward to worshiping today, but the worship just wasn't really my style. They had a new band that was there, and so I didn't really enjoy worship, and I left there just kind of let down. And so I would throw out this word worship, and if I were to go back and look over that, I would probably conclude, well, worship is something that takes place on a specific day, maybe amongst a specific group of people and at a specific place, And there's also this leader of the worship that happens. And depending on how that leader did or how the band performed or the style, worship could either be good or bad. And worship could either make you really happy and joyful or worship could be a letdown. And that would be my definition of worship if I were to look back on the conversation that I just had. But I think if we look at scripture, we'll find a very different definition of worship. And tonight, the verse that we're going to look at is Hebrews 12, 28 to 29. And this is how it reads. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful 
and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So it is within this verse that we are going to find our definition for worship. But tonight I don't just want to know what worship is. I want to know how we get there. So those will be the two things that we're looking at this evening. What is worship and how do we get to a place of worship? Because worship is not a location that we go to. It's a location in here. So we're, we'll, we'll look at that. And I want to look at a story this evening. And I want to see this passage come to life through an individual. And this individual can be found in John chapter 4. You can either turn into your Bibles or you can follow along on the screen. It'll be John chapter 4. We'll look at verses 1 through 29. This will be a story that you are very familiar with. Um, maybe you haven't looked at it through the eyes of worship, though. Instead of seeing how we should act as followers of Jesus and how we can be Jesus to others, I want tonight for us to put ourselves in the place of the lady that comes to meet Jesus. So here we are, John 4, 1 through 29, beginning with verse 1. This is the woman at the well. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. I want to pause there just for a second. If you were to look at a map, geographically, it would make sense that they would go through Samaria, where Jesus is coming from. If you head straight north and you're trying to get up to Jerusalem, you are going to run through Samaria. But it was socially unacceptable for any Jew to go through Samaria because Samaria were a people that were unclean. And so what the Jews would do is they would actually go out of their way. They would go around Samaria to get up to Jerusalem. So when it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, he didn't have to geographically. There was a way around. And and like I said, culturally, it was not okay to go through Samaria. What's happening here in this story is that Jesus is being led by the Spirit of God, and therefore as he is led and prompted by the Spirit of God, he has to do as the Spirit of God is leading. And so this is what is actually happening when we read that he had to go through Samaria. So we'll continue from there. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and this is actually directly north from where Jesus was, near the plot of ground where Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, You're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man that you, are, that you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah, 
called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So as we're reading this story, there's a few things that I want to pull out. Three things. Three things that I think are fundamental in worship actually taking place. And as we work through this, we'll get to the definition of what worship is. But the first, the first thing that has to happen if worship is going to take place at all is that we have to come into an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. And we see this happen with this woman. But what is funny about this is that for us, maybe we come to church hoping that we may encounter Jesus. We open up our Bibles not just to read and find good news or to find information or be told what to do, but we open up our Bibles so that we can encounter Jesus. This, this woman is walking and wants nothing to do with anybody. This woman goes at noon, and the reason for that is because no one goes at noon. It's so hot. There's going to be no one there. There's going to be no one out. She doesn't want to come across anybody at all. And so she heads and makes her way to the well to draw water because she knows no one's going to be there. But then she runs into Jesus. And the funny thing about this is Jesus would actually be more safe than any other Samaritan. For one, Jesus is a man. He's a Jewish man. But being a man, and especially a Jewish man, he would never speak to a woman. He would never speak to her. He would never acknowledge her. He would never even give value to her as if she were a human being. Because this is how Jewish men would act when they came across Samaritans. Um, this is very similar to me. I just was in a city where we were doing a missions trip, and we um, were walking by homeless people. And a lot of times it's really easy just to walk by them, to not acknowledge them, and therefore to not even give value to them as humans. And our kids and I got to experience this as we were homeless for a while. And we got to experience that rejection. And we got to experience what it means to not be even acknowledged or given value as a human being. She knew this. This was her life when it came to Jewish men. But secondly, being a Jewish man and Jews never going through Samaria— she would not be known by him. He would not know her actions. He would not know her lifestyle. He would know nothing about the way that she has lived, and therefore she was safe. Because what we know about this woman is the fact that she was going at noon when no one was going to be there. She lived in guilt. She lived in shame. She wanted to be unnoticed and never being acknowledged or given value to. She knew what it meant to be devalued. And having had five husbands and now being with a man who was not her husband, she knew what it meant to be unloved. This woman's experienced a lot. And now she encounters Jesus and she thinks she's safe. <laughs> she has no idea what she just walked into. My uncle, my uncle, the very first time that he ever encountered Jesus, he did it by accident kind of like this lady. And I love to hear the story. There is no greater story that I love to hear than when people first tell me about their encounter with Jesus Christ and when they first came to know him. And my uncle grew up, he wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He wanted nothing to do with church. The only connection that he had with church was that he really liked Christian girls because they were always so nice and he didn't know what it was. So he someday thought, maybe I'll just marry a Christian girl because they're so nice. But he wanted nothing to do with Christianity, Christian lifestyle, anything like that. But he got to a place where he was so distraught and so fed up and he had graduated from college and he didn't know what to do with himself. He found himself crying out to God, almost like against his will, right? Didn't really want this. But he finds himself crying out to God and how he describes it to me. He says, Jonathan, it was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced, and he said, I generally don't tell people because it was so strange. But he said, I'm crying out to God, and all of a sudden, I hear waterfalls. He says, I hear this waterfall, and it's just like drowning everything out that's going on inside of me. And he said, after hearing this waterfall, he said, I was so overcome by peace that I just stopped and I listened. 
And I loved hearing that from my uncle because in Revelation, actually, when John gets this revelation of who Jesus is, and he gets a picture of Jesus, and he begins to describe Jesus, this is how he describes. He says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. And my uncle says, I did not know who I had just encountered. And he said, I did not know that the voice of the Lord was like water. He said, I didn't know what I had walked into. But he said, I met Jesus that day. He's never turned away since. And I love it because this woman is walking into a situation where she has no idea what she is getting herself into and she encounters the Son of God. And I love Jesus' conversation with her because Jesus knew her so intimately. He knew her so well that when she says, why are you here? Why are you talking to me? He could have just said, because I love you. And that would have been true. He could have looked at her and he said, because I love you and I'm actually here for you. But that would have meant nothing to her. She's heard, I love you so often that those words mean nothing. And this would have been just another man that came across trying to get something for himself. Instead, Jesus engages with her. But what we find happening in this moment is not Jesus just sharing about how much he loves her. Jesus does something here that she's actually used to. Jesus begins to strip her. Now this woman being married five times and now being with a man who is not her husband knows exactly what it means to be stripped. But Jesus the Redeemer, Jesus the one who absolutely loves her, Jesus the one who forgives everything, looks straight into her heart and begins to peel things away. She's never been stripped like this before. This is different. And Jesus begins to have a conversation with her. And now we know the mess that was going on in her life. We know that she feels unloved. We know that she feels devalued. And we know that she does not have a good view of men. There's a lot going on emotionally inside of her. And Jesus is going to address that. But there is also a huge spiritual issue that is happening inside of her. And Jesus wants to expose that. So the very first thing we have is an encounter. The second thing is Jesus exposes once we have encountered him. And there are three things here that Jesus wants to expose inside of this woman. And the first thing that he decides he's going to go after is this understanding of salvation. And Jesus actually says that salvation comes from the Jews. So this is an area in her life that she cannot see because the Jews don't travel through Samaria. The Jews don't talk to Samaritans. The Jews are never going to bring good news to the Samaritans. And so Jesus comes with good news and he's going to expose something in her that is completely hidden from her eyes. So he comes and he speaks and he says, salvation comes from the Jews and Jesus comes to bring her salvation. So he comes to expose the fact that she's not clear on what salvation is. And we find this out in her story as they continue to dialogue. The second thing, though, that we see happening here is that Jesus comes to correct the idea of worship, that it has to take place at a certain location and that it has to be in a certain style. Jesus comes and he says, actually, the place of worship isn't on this mountain. And it's actually not even in Jerusalem where the Jews will claim. But he says, a time has come, and this is beautiful. He says, a time has actually now 
come. Like this time is actually here and you are living in this time. A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will not only worship in spirit, but also in truth. And Jesus is coming to take away the lie that she has to go to a certain place to worship. He exposes this lie of worship. The second thing, or the third thing, I guess, is that Jesus has to expose this misunderstanding of who he is. And we see this actually break down throughout the story. Where Jesus comes in, first of all, he's, he's just a man who is there. He's a Jewish man. But then we, we learn as, as she is focusing and is engaged with him, she gets to a point where she says, I see that you are a prophet. She says, I don't know much about you, but what you just told me, I can see that you are a prophet. But then she questions, but you are claiming that you are greater than our father, Israel. Israel, from whom we have even gotten our name, are you saying that you are greater than Israel? Are you claiming to be greater than him? Jesus is like, I'm actually the one that made the covenant with him. You don't know that yet. Are you claiming to be greater than our father, Israel? He's exposing lies. He's exposing misunderstandings. And the whole reason why Jesus is doing this is because he does love her. You see, when Jesus exposes, when Jesus strips away, when Jesus peels back layers, whatever word you want to use, there's one thing that we know about Jesus. Jesus loves and Jesus is good. And therefore, any time that he exposes anything within us, he has a good purpose and a good plan for it. I think to um, uh, first, no, second, second Timothy, Where all scripture is God-breathed, I believe it's 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and instructing. A lot of times that hurts to get rebuked, to get corrected. We don't like those things, but when Jesus does that, it is because he is good, and it is because he loves us, and it is because he has already forgiven us, and he wants to expose something in us that has kept us from actually worshiping him, has kept us from actually being in communion with, with him and therefore walking hand in hand with him. When Jesus exposes things within us, it is actually for our good. And at first it may hurt. But if we allow Jesus to continue to do his work, those things will be broken away and we will actually get to a place where we can truly worship. For worship to take place, we have got to come to an encounter with Jesus. And we've got to come to a point in our lives where we are okay with him exposing whatever it is that he wants to expose within us. You see, for Jesus in this conversation, it was never about the water. The lady, she just kept getting hooked on this water. Well, what about this water? What about this well? It wasn't about the water, but Jesus keeps that in his peripheral, but that's not what he's focusing in on. And then it appears that maybe it's, about, maybe it's about the man. Maybe it's about the husbands. Maybe it's about the sinful lifestyle that she's living. But actually Jesus keeps that on the peripheral because his, his reason for being there is not for the husbands and the fact that she's living a sinful lifestyle. You'll hear a lot of people that will say, well, maybe she was the one that was actually in sin because it was her that was going from man to man, husband to husband, and now she's with another guy and it focuses on her. And Jesus says that it was actually her, the one, going from husband to husband and man to man. But then you'll hear others say, well, no, according to the times and the culture, it was actually the man that could divorce at any moment's notice for any given reason. If she didn't come home and have the meal prepared for him as he wanted, he could give her divorce papers and say, I'm done with you. Go find somebody else, whatever reason that he wanted to. Jesus didn't care about that, though. That's not why he was there. Jesus was there for her. So he keeps the water in his peripheral. He keeps the husbands and the men in his peripheral, but he is focused right in on her heart. And the reason for her not being able to see that is because she has so many things up in front of her and Jesus just continues to peel them away. And he exposes each one as he peels it away because he is only going to be able to reveal himself to her and she will only be able to receive him once those things have been exposed and peeled away. And this is exactly what Jesus wants to do inside of each one of us as we come into his word. There are things that he has to peel away. Every single time we step into his house, there are things that he has to peel away inside of us. We have to give him permission to do that. 
But we've also got to realize that if Jesus is going to do this, it's because he is good. And it's because something very good is going to come out of this. And as we see this happening with the woman, we see that, yes, in fact, something good does happen. The third thing, then, she expresses her worship. Now, what I don't want you to get hooked on is how she expresses, because I don't want you to focus on the expression. I want you to focus on what goes on inside of her heart, because there is absolutely nothing that is external that will determine worship inside of our hearts. For so many years, I thought it was the music, and I thought it was the style, and I thought it was the church that I was at, and I thought it was the ambiance of the place where I was, and I thought maybe it was about the worship team and whether or not they were prepared. That has nothing to do with it. They're a part of worship with us, but if worship is not happening in here, it doesn't matter what's happening on the stage. It doesn't matter where we are at. Worship can't happen if it's not already happening in here. And if we have not given Jesus the permission to work inside of us, worship won't happen no matter where we are at. We may feel good about what is taking place when we are there, but true worship can't happen if it's not already happening inside of here. And this is what we see happening in the woman. The expression is only the outward expression of what has already taken place on the inside, and she can't contain it. And what we see is this woman who was once so afraid to walk out into an area where there might be people that she goes in the hot of noon. She now is the one sprinting back into town. Did you catch it? She forgot why she even came to the well. She leaves her bucket. That didn't matter anymore to her. The only thing that mattered was Jesus. We see that she truly did receive this living water that was inside of her because she didn't even care about her bucket anymore. The thing that she was so focused on when she came no longer mattered because the only thing that mattered is Jesus. And so she is sprinting into the town. Her guilt Her shame, her rejection is completely removed. And she sprints into this town and says, come see a man who has told me everything that I have ever done. When have any of us ever been so grateful to Jesus that we say, let me tell you everything that I have ever done. And let me tell you about the man that completely washed it clean and took it away. She's free. And she's free to worship. And so we find this lady who was once so terrified to be around people is now making her way to find as many people as we possibly can. And, and, and it maybe looks like she is uncertain about this guy because she says, could this possibly be the Messiah? But actually we read a few verses later that it is because of the testimony of this woman that many Samaritans come to believe. And they say, it's not just because of what you have said now, because now we have also encountered Jesus. And now it is because of him that we too believe just like you. This woman had a firm faith. And she is in reverence and is in awe of this man, Jesus Christ. And this is what worship is. She has now received a kingdom that is unshaken. Because she has received a heavenly kingdom and she has a well within herself now of living water. And therefore she is so grateful that she goes and proclaims in worship, in confession of who Jesus is. Because of what he's done inside of her. Now real quickly, I just want to bring out maybe some Uh, ways of worship that we might find in expression. These are ones that are found in scripture and ones that we should be familiar with. But this is also, once again, this is an expression of worship. And this is something that happens when there has already been something that has taken place inside of us because worship happens in here. But what we read in scriptures, we read several different ways that people can worship. And we read about We read about uh, David singing. We see this all throughout the Psalms as David is writing Psalms and he's praising God in the worship of singing. And we see this in confession, what we just saw with the woman at the well. We see this with David. This is my favorite example. David dancing and he's singing and he's celebrating the goodness of God. And he's doing it in a linen cloth. He's like stripped himself down to almost nothing. I love it. He has peeled everything away. He is free. And he says, I'll become even more undignified than this. David is worshiping. He's celebrating and he's dancing. We see this in service with Isaiah. Isaiah, after seeing God in all of his glory, says, here am I. I send me. Sometimes our service is an act of worship to God, or it is a response of worship to God. Another thing may be posture. We sang a song about raising our hands up. Sometimes we just want to reach up and touch God. Sometimes 
Sometimes maybe the weight of our sin has just taken us to this place where we are on our knees before Jesus and we just see how good and how holy he is and we are weighed down by the fact that we are not yet there. You see, what worship is, it is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. We see this in the life of this lady. And I think this is what the Apostle Paul is referring to when he writes in Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your proper worship. You see, the thing is, our God is a consuming fire. Did you notice that? Can we look at this verse in Hebrews once again? Our God is a consuming fire fire. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and in awe for our God is a consuming fire. When Jesus, when the Spirit of God reveals himself to us and exposes and strips away, he doesn't just leave us empty and exposed. He fills us with his spirit. And this is the beauty of it is we are filled with his spirit. We are so consumed by him because he is a consuming fire that our response might be like this woman to run back and just proclaim Jesus because it is no longer about us. Our lives no longer matter. The shame and the guilt we once carried is no longer there. And we are no longer concerned with ourselves. It is not about us. It is not about our desires and what we want. Everything is about Jesus because he is the only one and the only thing that we care about because we have been so consumed by our God. And this is when worship happens. Let me pray for us. As we close out this evening, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be so consumed by your Holy Spirit. Jesus, that nothing around us would matter, that there would be nothing external that we would put out to determine whether or not you are worthy of being worshipped. Jesus, you are always worthy of being worshipped. But sometimes what's going on inside of us may not allow us to worship you as you deserve to be worshiped so properly and extravagantly and lovingly. So Jesus, I pray that even as we leave this place, whatever it is that you need to expose in us, whatever needs to be stripped away, whatever needs to be peeled back in as many layers as might need to be peeled away, Jesus, we give you permission to do that so our lives would be nothing less than a life of absolute worship to our Heavenly Father. Pray this in your name. Amen.